So welcome to this evening's very special uh, 5 by 15 event with the Orwell Foundation, featuring an incredible lineup of writers reflecting on the life and legacy of George Orwell. Um, from corruption of truth to pervasive new technologies, from poverty and inequality to the rise of political extremism, George Orwell's concerns are as relevant today to the 21st century as they were to the times when he conceived his great novels. And tonight we hear from DJ Taylor, from Rebecca Solnit, from Joshua Yaffa, and we have the chance to see an exclusive film from Ali uh, Smith and Sarah Wood. So it's a huge honor for 5 by 15 to be bringing this special event together this evening. Um, first up, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, James Tukey from the Orwell Foundation, who has made this evening's program possible and who is going to say a couple of words about, um, about the, the foundation. So welcome, James. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi. Thanks, Daisy. And good evening, everyone. It's really lovely to be here and to be part of bringing together tonight's speakers. Um, so I work on the Orwell Book Prizes for political writing and political fiction, which last year were awarded to two of the speakers who will be seeing tonight, Joshua Yaffa uh, and Ali Smith. The Orwell Foundation is an independent charity based at University College London. And for over 25 years, it has tried to promote and perpetuate the achievements of George Orwell and to use his work to celebrate honest writing and reporting uncover hidden lives and confront uncomfortable truths. And in doing so, promote the values of integrity and decency that was so central to Orwell and his work. The Orwell Prizes are a central part of that aim as we ask our judges to consider the books and journalism they read in the light of political purpose, clarity of expression, intellectual courage, critical thought, and artful writing. The four writers you'll hear from tonight have these qualities in rich supply as well as a good dollop of that integrity and decency I mentioned before, which sometimes feels like a rare commodity today. In November, we'll be relaunching the Orwell Prizes with new judging panels and a refined structure, along with a renewed commitment to thinking hard about the role of the writer and writing in politics and political debate. In 1946, Orwell wrote, when I sit down to write a book, I do not say to myself, I am going to produce a work of art. I write it because there is some lie I want to expose, some fact to which I want to draw attention, and my initial concern is to get a hearing. But I could not do the work of writing a book, or even a long magazine article, if it were not also an aesthetic experience. Uh, we are committed and will continue to draw attention to and give a hearing to the writing in all manner of forms, which manages, despite all the pressure and noise, to make political writing into an art. Thank you very much and thank you Daisy for helping me organize this it's a real pleasure to be here and I hope you all enjoy the evening. Thank you James thank you for your words and for all the all the work that you do. So that brings us to the start of our event this evening. Um, our first speaker um, is joining us from the very south of, of Cornwall DJ Taylor um, he's a writer and a critic, um, a trustee of both the Orwell Foundation and the Orwell Archive at University College London, and he's currently working on annotated editions of Orwell's six novels. Um, the first two volumes, Animal Farm and 1984, appeared earlier this year. His second biography of Orwell, titled Orwell, The New Life, is scheduled to be published in 2023. His first volume, which was called Orwell, The Life, won the Whitbread Biography Prize in 2003. So over to you, David, and thank you very much for being with us. Thanks very much indeed. Um, yes, a very long time ago now, it seems, I wrote a book called Orwell, The Life, and it seems to me in retrospect that that uh, definite article was a bit presumptuous because um, there are many Orwells, Orwell led many lives. Uh, he lived those lives in separate compartments. This was something that always struck his friends, that people who thought that they knew him very well would then come across sides to him, uh, would come across other friends that they didn't know, and even people who sort of lived by cheek, cheek by jowl with him um, at various stages in his life tended to be nonplussed, to be flummoxed, to find out things they hadn't previously considered. There are many interpretations, um, many ways of looking at what, in some ways, is an extraordinary down-to-earth man, and that, and uh, from, uh, from other points of view, looks stratospherically complex and layered. Um, so why is it that um, after, I don't know, 18 years, I should sit down and try to write a second book about him? 
Um, one very obvious reason is that, um, and all biographers, any biographers um, and readers of biographies watching uh, this program this evening, uh, will know that uh, there's never a finite end. There's always new material. There's always new stuff. Quite often the new material jumps out at you uh, when you've just completed uh, the book, when the book is actually in almost you know, coming into press. This happened to me last time, and I can remember an extraordinary evening, or in fact, early morning. It was about three o'clock in the morning when the fax machine, if you remember fax machines, suddenly started spewing out letters that Orwell had written to Malcolm Muggeridge in the 1940s that had been lost for years um, in a rather obscure Bible college in Illinois, and they'd agreed to send them to me. And I sat there looking at them and thinking to myself, hang on, there isn't very much time. I don't think that these are even going to be able to be included in Orwell the Life. And in fact, I think in the end, they made, a, they made an appendix. Um, so in, in certainly it's in very recently, over the last two or three years, huge caches of Orwell material have started coming to light again, um, mostly from the 1930s. Um, quite a lot of them suffered girlfriends, people he knew in Southwold at the time he spent living in his parents' house there. And um, they fill in great tracks of previously unmarked time and it's now possible to say much more about him in that 1930s period uh, than it was before. And it's also possible to see him carrying some of those relationships forward and keeping, well, in some ways, never let people go, especially the women in his life. And even when he was happily married to his first wife, Eileen, in the late 1930s and early 40s, he was still keeping up with people, keeping up with women from the past, in some cases, agonizing over what in those, by that time, was subjunctive relationships, things that had been and gone. So there's the wealth of new material. Uh, secondly, there's the fact that always occurs to any biographer and to readers of biographies that biographies necessarily are snapshots. Um, they're um, one sensibility rubbing up against another sensibility at a finite point in time. Um, you change your views about people. There are different ways of looking. There are certainly different ways of looking at Orwell that I've come across in the 18 years since I last did it. Uh, and in that time, of course, Orwell scholarship and Orwell studies has marched on into all kinds of abstruse corners. There have been, I suppose, a series of microbiographies of very aspect, various aspects of his work about um, <clears throat> his trip up north in 1936 that produced the road to Wigan Pier, uh, his life in Southwold in the 1930s. There have been uh, there have been biographies of both his wives, a very good biography last year by Sylvia Topp of Eileen, his first wife, who died. Uh, so tragically on the operating table in 1945, and a previous book by Hilary Sperling about Sonia, Sonia Brownwell, his second wife. Um, so Orwell studies expands in leaps and bounds, always providing new angles, new ways of looking at, looking at Orwell. Uh, Professor John Sutherland, five years ago, even wrote a book called Orwell's Nose about his characteristically uh, intense sense of smell and the kind of olfactory sensibility that he brought uh, to his trips around the world. So, um, <clears throat> so there's that aspect of it too. There are always um, so many angles. There's a third thing that began to strike me as I began work on this, is that uh, 72 years now, nearly since he died at the age of 46, in January 1950, there are so few survivors left. Uh, and in fact, Orwell, I fear, is sliding over the rim of memory. Um, when I started seriously to work on this book a couple of years ago, I think there were, I, I calculated, uh, I sat down with Richard Blair, Orwell's adopted son, who's a great friend to Orwell studies, uh, and has always been a, 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 a source of sage counsel and prudent advice. And Richard and I calculated there were, this is two years ago, that there were 11 people left in the world who had coherent memories of Orwell. Uh, and this doesn't, this doesn't include people who were small children, sort of remembered him vaguely being at their parents' houses in the late 1940s. And I sat down yesterday and decided to calculate how many people there were left. And I got to a grand total of eight. And the oldest, the eldest of them is a woman aged 100, uh, whose father uh, owned a hop farm in Kent, which Orwell, Orwell went and worked in 1931. Um, the youngest is Richard Blair, who was, uh, who was 77, a real, a real stripling, uh, you know, in the, in the context of people who remember Orwell. And the next youngest is a lady of 78, who was a girl of six, who uh, was taken by her mother to, vi to visit Orwell at University College Hospital, I mean, a few weeks before his death. That's all there is left. Um, in a few years' time, um, there will probably be three or four people. 
and then a few years after that there will be nobody and so as I say well we'll skip off the rim of memory uh, and there will be nothing left. Um, the fourth thing of course is, is the excitement, this, this always affects biographers, is this, this the, um, the excitement of the chase, the knowledge that there are still holy grails of Orwell studies out there that you might just with a fair wind behind you uh, be able to get in, in some kind of touch with. The great thing of course are the papers that were stolen from Orwell in Barcelona in 1937 by the Russians, the Soviet secret, secret police, which, which I know are in the old NKVD archive in Moscow, but nobody is ever able we have to gain access to them, uh, despite representations at the highest level. I know they're sitting there, and at some time they will they will come up, they will come to light. Now, the thing about Orwell's life is that it, uh, it does divide up into these rather neat compartments. Um, anyone who's ever read it in, in depth will know that. You know, there was the, there's the terrible prep school that he went to, uh, there's Eton College, there's the time serving the Burma police as a servant of the Raj. Uh, there's the time in Paris that produced uh, one half of Down and Out in Paris and London. Uh, <clears throat> there's the working in the bookshop, there's the going to fight in, there's the trip to Wigan Pier, there's the going to fight in Spain, uh, <clears throat> there's working for the BBC during the war, there's being literary editor of the left wing weekly magazine Tribune. Uh, and then there's the, the life living on the remote inner Hebridean Isle of Jura, getting on with 1984 and slowly dying of tuberculosis and just managed to finish, just managing to finish the book before he died. Um, how does one examine that? Well, I've always been interested in, in, in something that Orwell's great friend Anthony Pohl said, which was that um, what happens to somebody in their life is not really important, it's what they think happens to them. Uh, this is especially true of Orwell, um, who was a great one for making very sharp retrospectives about his, about his life, which he expected his friends to agree with. And um, one of the interesting things I think in approaching him biographically is to take some of these statements, statements about his childhood, which he thought was unhappy, uh, statements about his family, statements about his early life, and, ho and hold them up to you know, the light of other people's testimony and uh, to examine what, what, and to see, to try and sort of test the proof of these. And quite often, um, when you examine them in detail, you find a, a, a rather different or a rather different kind of life. Uh, and a person who was clearly mythologizing the view that he took of himself, in, in, in some cases, I think in rather devious, devious ways. Um, there's also um, the real, the excitement too, I think, lies in tracking down the sort of the more obscure people, the, the, the great and good, the people who knew Orwell, his literary friends in the 1940s, all left memories of him that are set in stone. They wrote 30 or 40 years later, what they thought about Orwell was what they thought, um, and uh, it's not so much that they sanctified him, rather than they had a, they had an opinion of it, which 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 stayed solid for the rest of their lives. It, and it's when you go and um, it's when you go and examine the Orwell out on the margin, the Orwell living in Suffolk, say in the 1930s, coming up against ordinary people before he was famous, and those people tended to have a rather different view of him uh, than say somebody like T. S. Eliot or Anthony Polwood. And you also find little details of that early life, which then move forward into the books themselves. So I was fascinated years ago, once in Southwold, I interviewed a very old gentleman called uh, George Bumstead, who'd been a grocer in Southwold in the 1930s and had premises just down the road from Orwell's parents' house. And he claimed, and I, I was rather, I wasn't really very sure about this, but Mr. Bumstead claimed that the noise of Orwell's typewriter kept him awake at night as it drifted down Southwold High Street. But as I was leaving, he called me back and he said, I'll tell you something, he said, that George Orwell, he said in his broad Suffolk accent, he put my brother in his book. And I said, I have no idea what you're talking about, which book, you know, what brother? And he said, you go home and read your copy of 1984 and you'll see he put my brother in his book. And I went back home and I read the scene when Winston Smith, and Smith is waiting to be interrogated at the Ministry of Love. And there's a starving man sitting beside him to whom another of the prisoners attempts to offer a fragment of bread. And immediately the telescreen bursts out with an accusatory, Bumstead, Bumstead J, 2173, let fall that piece of bread. And that's Jack Bumstead, the grocer's son from Southwold, whose name had stuck in Orwell's head for 15 years and re-emerged in 1984. Um, so there I, here I am, you know, looking for all these tantalizing things. At the moment, I'm puzzling myself about a curious scrapbook that's turned up from Southwold in the 1930s, in which some, some Suffolk artist has drawn pictures of Orwell um, as he was as a young man. I've no idea who it was. I've no idea how these pictures came to come in this book. So that's another one of these, these fascinations that I'm up and about and looking at. 
So this is the kind of thing one's engaged upon. It's, it's terribly frightening because you know you're going to miss stuff and you're going to get things wrong. It's terribly exciting because you know there is stuff out there that you hope you're going to find in time. And then, of course, there'll be a whole heap of fragments left for some other biographer to come along a few years after that and have another go. And one final thought I think I'll leave you with as this, as, as this, this quest begins and we get ready to, I'm very interested to hear what Rebecca has to say because she's off on another sort of, another micro Orwell pursuit on Orwell, Orwell's relationship with nature and Orwell's roses. Um, but one final thought I will leave you with in terms of the little sidelights and the little sort of illuminating bulbs that sort of shine light on Orwell is the, um, is Orwell's, Orwell's recreations in the 1930s. And it turns out that his, the great thing, the thing he spent time doing in the 1930s, was he used to go ice skating in Stratham Ice Rink. And there's a wonderful letter I discovered to a girl he was in love with and wanted to marry, but who turned him down, where he says, you know, I've been really trying very hard to perfect my technique. And this was the little, this is also accompanied by a little sketch of him ice skating. He says, and I can do it all, except the only thing I can't do is skate backwards, and then I fall over. Thanks very much. Thank you very, very much, David, for sharing your extraordinary insight and stories as Orwell's biographer. What a fantastic um, start to our event. So thank you very, very much. It was a joy to have you with us. And now joining us from San Francisco, as David said, we have Rebecca Solnit, who is going to be telling us a little bit about her forthcoming book, Orwell's Roses, which explores Orwell's um, involvement with plants and the political um, intertwinement of, 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 um, of nature and power. So Rebecca, um, her memoir, Recollections of My Non-Existence, was longlisted for the 2021 Orwell Prize for political writing and shortlisted for the 2021 James Tate Black Award. And we were very pleased to work with the London Review of Books on a launch event for that uh, fantastic book. But she's also the author of The Far Away Nearby, Wonderlust, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, A Paradise Built in Hell, Men Explain Things to Me, um, and many, many essays on feminism, activism, social change, hope, and climate change. So welcome, Rebecca. Thank you for being with us, um, despite the power cut in San Francisco, and over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, a pleasure to be with you and good morning from San Francisco to your good evening in the UK. In the spring of 1936, a writer planted roses. That's the opening line of my new book, which is about both the writer and the flowers and the many things their conjunction points to. Four years ago, I went on an errand for my friend Sam Green, the filmmaker. For a project of his about trees, I was looking for the fruit trees George Orwell planted around the same time as those roses. In between his trip to the industrial north of the UK to look at coal mining, poverty and unemployment, and his trip to Spain to fight, fight fascism in the Spanish Civil War. The kind people who lived in Orwell's college in Wallington, Hertfordshire, where he'd done that planting, invited me in and showed me around gave me tea and told me that the fruit trees had been cut down in the 1990s. They also eventually mentioned that Orwell's roses were still growing and took me out to see them. This was a joy and a wonder to see and the planting of the seed that grew into this book. My hosts that memorable day are no longer quite so confident that the big rose bushes in their garden that were flowering even on a cool November day were the ones George Orwell planted almost 80 years earlier. But at the time of my, vi uh, my visit, that encounter seemed to offer a startlingly direct connection to the writer. It also raised questions, or perhaps it gathered together big and interesting questions I'd been thinking about for a long time. For more than a third of a century, I'd known and loved the essay Orwell wrote that mentions the planting of those roses and those fruit, fruit trees and talks about how if you plant a tree, the act might outlive all your other acts considerably. It's an essay called A Good Word for the Vicar of Bray. And I always thought it was an outlier who Orwell might have been if he'd lived in a less turbulent time. But it turned out that it was really who he was despite the times. I had never really thought hard enough about what it meant that this great prophetic voice about totalitarianism and lies and propaganda had also been a passionate gardener and a lover and planter of flowers. The roses and the passions made me go back and look harder at him. I had read most of his books and many of his essays. He'd been a major influence on my own evolution into an essayist. 
for I had accepted what seemed to be the popular image of him as a stern, grim pessimist. What I found when I looked for myself was someone entirely different, a man who took immense pleasure in small domestic things, in junk shops, English cooking, fishing, a good cup of tea or a mug of stout, children's books, nursery rhymes, popular songs, fishing, but most of all in animals, plants and the natural world, including roses. In 1940, he offered this biographical sketch of himself an answer to an author questionnaire. The thing I care about most in gardening, vegetable gardening. This book, Orwell's Roses, explores what those roses could mean uh, the roses he planted in Wallington in 1936 and after, and then over again on the Isle of Jura and on his first wife's grave in Newcastle, or rather to explore the questions. Some of the most important for me were about the relationships between politics and nature and between pleasure and beauty and political engagement. We, particularly the we that is the le left, often see austerity, joylessness, and nonstop toil as signs of virtue and true commitment and anything else is slacking off. But one of my questions was, what is it that makes it possible to do the work that is of highest value to others and one's central purpose in life and may appear to others, sometimes even to oneself, trivial, irrelevant, indulgent, pointless, distracted, or any of those other pejoratives with which the quantifiable beats down the unquantifiable. Another one of the tangents I went on with this book uh, was the great phrase bread and roses coined, coined by a woman suffragist campaigning for women's votes in 1910 in the American Midwest, a phrase that said, of course we need bread by which they meant the basic sustenance, food, clothing and shelter, but it was this radical demand for roses, not as just as literal roses, but as music, culture, recreation, free time, beauty, pleasure, art, and really very different than a lot of left-wing movements that really do settle for the bread and disdain the roses. Orwell's gardening and his rambling about the countryside and the pleasure he took in watching birds and other small creatures and weather and seasons seemed to give him respite from that self-assigned job he once described as facing unpleasant facts, which he did so well. Perhaps respite is the conventional framework. It gave, maybe it gave him the backbone to do it, or maybe it was how he liked to do his thinking. His writing often strays from the small and pleasurable to the large and dangerous and back again. And the rural fed his imagination and fueled his metaphors. What he knew of farm animals, for example, allowed him to write the scathing allegory of Soviet history that is animal farm. And he recounts how seeing a small boy whipping a huge cart horse was the first inspiration, how the cart horse was like the working class, not realizing its power in comparison to, uh, to that small boy who might have been the ruling classes. He found too in the particular intangible, an antidote to the perils of dogma and ideology. He distrusted abstractions and sweeping statements and reverted to the concrete, the specific, again and again, and often found a detail that undermined a simple conclusion. For example, when he went to Germany to report on the end of the Second World War, he came across a, he came across a corpse near the footbridge that was one of the last unbombed bridges across the river through Stuttgart, he wrote. A dead German soldier was lying supine at the foot of the steps. His face was a waxy yellow. On his breast, someone had laid a bunch of the lilac, which was blooming everywhere. The lilacs don't negate the corpse or the war, but they complicate it as the specific often does the general. So does the unseen hand that had laid a bouquet on a soldier and the news that lilacs were blooming in Stuttgart, which in 1945 was shards and rubble from the thousands of tons of bombs dropped on it by British airplanes. The flowers say that this person, an English reader at the time, would look upon as the enemy, was someone's friend or beloved, 
that this corpse had a personal as well as a political history and that spring had come despite everything. The roses also prompt the question of what Orwell was for. Orwell is renowned and remembered for what he wrote was, authoritarianism and totalitarianism, the question of language and politics by lies and propaganda and sloppiness, the erosion of privacy as, an, as a foundation of liberty. From these forces and from the more positive writing, it's possible to determine that he was for equality and democracy, a democratic socialism that would eliminate poverty and obscene wealth, clarity of language, integrity and honesty of intentions, private life and all its pleasures and joys, the freedom and liberty that also depend to some extent on privacy from oversight and interference. He wrote quite a bit about those things he was for actually, and a number of essays that amount to a significant part of his work and in many, many passages in his books, which are bound with descriptions of nature. His grimmest writings have moments of beauty. His most lyrical essays nevertheless grapple with substantial issues. There are flowers and bird song and human song, even in 1984, and they are crucial to it as what its protagonist reach, reaches for in his resistance to the regime. The very heart of that book, in my reading, is when Winston Smith contemplates a middle-aged woman hanging diapers on the clothesline and singing in a beautiful Cockney voice. It's the third time he's seen her in the courtyard in the proletarian district where he rents a secret room to continue his love affair. The third time he's seen her pinning up those diapers and singing a song that he thinks is sentimental tripe, but that is about love and memory and attachment and devotion. This third time is just before the thought police come and drag him away to be tortured and brainwashed. But I believe the book rests its hope, rests its hope, not on Winston's narrow shoulders, but on this sturdy working class woman. Orwell writes of his protagonist. It struck him for the first time that she was beautiful. It had never before occurred to him that the body of a woman of 50, blown up to monstrous dimensions by childbearing, then hardened, roughened by work till it was coarse in the grain, like an overripe turnip, could be beautiful. But it was so, and after all, he thought, why not? The solid contourless body, like a block of granite, and the rasping red skin bore the same relation to the body of a girl as the rose hip to the rose. Why should the fruit be held inferior to the flower? The regime of Big Brother in that novel seeks to eradicate hope and memory and history and human relations, to create an unchanging present in which it wields absolute control, not only of external events, but internal life. Love is subversive, memory is subversive, hope is subversive. This woman singing of love while hanging out the nappies, as eternal and enduring as a goddess, embodies them all, as well as Winston's belief that if there is hope, it lies with the proles. Even perception is subversive in this book. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears, Orwell writes. It was their final most essential command. Thus to trust those eyes and ears and to feed them with independent observation is subversive. Elsewhere in the book, Winston Smith looks to the laws of nature and physics for some kind of grounding. Stones are hard, water is wet, objects unsupported fall towards the earth's center, he says to himself. That is, he seeks to trust the evidence of his eyes and ears, to remember his <laughs> and to love, to enjoy nature, to protect a private inner life, to break rules, to understand the situation. Science, history, and one's own perception and attention to the world around you and inner life are tools of resistance to authoritarianism, Orwell tells us. The age of Trump has done much to remind us why this is so. Nature in Orwell's time was considered apolitical, a stable realm outside the scope of politics and human conflict and striving. The playwright Bertolt Brecht famously wrote, Ah, oh, what an age is this, when to, speak of, when to speak of trees is almost a crime, 
for it is a kind of silence about injustice. Now, of course, we can see that trees and injustice have a lot to say to each other, whether it's indigenous homelands being logged and devastated from Borneo to British Columbia, or trees as carbon sequestering forces countering our CO2, our CO2 emissions. The natural is not outside the political, but it was not in Orwell's time either. And part of the fodder for 1984 was the Soviet war against genetic science and its failed agricultural experiments that contributed to the mass famine killing millions in Ukraine and to the persecution of many scientists. And while the roses invited a new scrutiny of Orwell for me, the Orwell I found invited a new scrutiny of roses and of flowering plants and plants more generally in this book. While flowers are often dismissed as trivial, decorative and feminine, since the feminine is itself so often dismissed, plants made the world's atmosphere and soil and flowering plants are responsible for almost everything we eat. Either they are it or they feed it. In the case of almost everything but fishes and mushrooms and fiddlehead ferns. So I got an Orwell for our time. Our time being one where the same questions from his time about authoritarianism and lies and loss of privacy have become urgent again, and new questions about the imperiled natural world and how we imagine it or fail to do so need new answers. Thank you so much. Rebecca, thank you so, so much for being with us. It's such an honor to have had a preview into Orwell's Roses and we're so excited about it coming out in the UK on October the 21st. I know that copies can be pre-ordered and we will be putting the details in the chat so people can get a copy as soon as it hits the bookshelves. Thank you very, very much, Rebecca, and have a lovely rest of your day in San Francisco. So um, our next speaker this evening is Joshua Yaffa, a correspondent for The New Yorker based primarily in Moscow, um, in Russia, and the author of Between Two Fires, Truth, Ambition and Compromise in Putin's Russia, winner of the Orwell Prize for Political Writing 2021. He's also written for The Economist, The New York Times Magazine, National Geographic, um, Bloomberg Business Week, The New Republic and Foreign Affairs. Welcome, Josh. It's fantastic to have you with us, and I will hand over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction, and very glad to be uh, here with you all tonight. So, Soviet television, for all its faults, had a certain soothing quality. The rosy assurances, the predictable assortment of rote phrases and motifs, the rousing soundtrack of Time Forward by the composer Georgi Sviordov. By the later years of communist rule, with the system in slow motion decay, viewers know full well they were being shown a simulacrum of their daily lives. It's not that the Stalingrad tractor factory wasn't turning out a record number of combines or that this year's grain harvest in Ukraine had surpassed some new impressive amount of tonnage. Those triumphant stories may well have had some grounding in the truth or at least orbited in the same galaxy but it was all that wasn't shown that gave those tuned in the suspicion they were seeing a foggy or off-tilt version of reality. The geriatric decay of the ruling class, the shortages and inefficiency of the planned economy, the parallel personas of outward loyalty and inner escapism that so many had people had developed for themselves. It was a world in short of Orwellian fantasies brought to life in which double think the ability or habit or maybe even necessity to think one thing and act out another and to find space in your brain for both reign supreme. Orwell introduced doublethink to the world in 1984, bequeathing, bequeathing us a concept that holds true across so many epochs and political systems. The citizen trapped in an omnipresent system, Orwell writes, quote, knows in which direction his memories must be altered. He therefore knows that he is playing tricks with reality but by the exercise of doublethink, he also satisfies himself that reality is not violated. In this way, doublethink is uh, not uh, the forced or passive response of the victim, but rather an active process. The state can't manufacture doublethink on its own, but rather needs its citizens to engage in its production themselves. I'd go so far as to say that doublethink was the lingua franca of the late Soviet period the way that people made sense of their lives and bridged the gap between what they were expected to perform 
or at least nod along to, in what they thought and acted out in actual fact. In researching my book on the many compromises and moral gray zones uh, required of those making their way in today's Russia, I came across one episode in particular that provides a delightful and tragicomic illustration of Orwellian doublethink brought to life. Funerals of party officials were always a major event for Soviet television. The somber music, the recitation of the dearly departed's contribution to the communist project, the old men in suits who gathered on Red Square to send off their erstwhile comrade. Time and again, as one luminary after another left this world and went to the Bolshevik atheist afterlife, their casket was lowered into the hollowed ground with the television announcer repeating the same rote phrase at every funeral. An important party figure was always, quote, buried on Red Square by the Kremlin wall. This held for many years. So-and-so was buried on Red Square by the Kremlin wall. Now it was this person's turn to be buried uh, on Red Square by the Kremlin wall. Now that person was buried on Red Square by the Kremlin wall. A little boring and predictable, but no huge problem. Not yet a case yet for Orwell. But then at a certain point, with so many old men in power, and when enough of them had died, space in the Kremlin wall ran out. There wasn't any more room for new caskets. From a technical point of view, this wasn't a huge problem. The relevant Soviet body in charge of state funerals simply transitioned to cremating high ranking functionaries, preparing their ashes and urns that could then be placed in crevices inside the Kremlin wall. The issue, however, lay in the realm of symbols. In this case, those broadcast on television. No one bothered to pass the television announcers an updated script. And so, without instructions to the contrary, they continued to tell viewers what they always had. Television thus began airing state funerals at which viewers could see an urn being placed inside the Kremlin wall, while the voiceover told them of the dearly departed being, quote, buried on Red Square by the Kremlin wall. The dissonance continued. There was the urn on television for all to see, but the television itself is telling you buried, buried, buried. This all got so absurd that a commission of prominent Russian linguists wrote an appeal to the Central Committee. Look, they said, we don't mean to interfere in your high affairs of state, but we have a bit of a problem here. Aren't we confusing people with this whole urn with ashes being passed off as a burial thing? They proposed an alternative phrase for news anchors to read aloud on air. Quote, the urn with ashes was placed in the Kremlin wall. Seems sensible, nothing provocative or revolutionary, rather dully factual. But the call came back from the Central Committee. Leave things as they were, continued with the buried by the Kremlin wall wrote phraseology. The continuation and adherence to ritual was more important than a faithful reflection of reality itself. In fact, the Central Committee seemed to be saying, it is our prerogative to shape reality. Reality is not what you see, but rather what our traditions and belief and strictures demand that it be. This was the essence of Soviet propaganda, a project to convince the viewer of a certain fixed reality, and the viewer should at least nominally acquiesce with this ordered version of the world. Very Orwell, I would say. The system reserves the right to decide what reality is, or rather should be, and then broadcast the symbols and cues of that reality to all its subjects. This is not what modern propaganda claims to do, however. Not in today's Russia, nor I would argue where we encounter it elsewhere, including in our own societies. Modern propaganda has a much more fluid and postmodern approach. It doesn't claim to represent a single fixed truth and doesn't directly challenge the viewer's own observed reality. It is far too clever to expect a person to believe that someone is being buried under a red square when they can well see the urn is being placed inside the wall. Rather, this modern updated version of Propaganda 2.0 assaults the very notion of truth, making no claim to one truth over another, but rather that truth itself is an outmoded naive concept, that everyone knows you can't believe much of anything, each side is trying to deceive or manipulate you, so the only outcome left is to throw up your hands in exhaustion and give up on the entire enterprise of trying to decipher what's true and what's false. It's all a bit of a fog anyway, right? I got an up close and personal look at how this type of propaganda functions in modern Putin era Russia, when as part of research for my book Between Two Fires, I agreed to go on a daytime talk show on channel one. 
Russia's main state-run network. The show is called Vreme Pakajit, or Time Will Tell, and is essentially a political shout fest, a loud, crass debate show covering the issues of the day, which usually result, revolve around how the West is trying to keep Russia down or otherwise treat it unfairly. The program follows a, a set format. A few token liberals and a foreigner or two appear alongside pro-Kremlin journalists or politicians in front of a live audience, led by a pair of hosts who don't hide their skepticism of the liberals and foreigners and who always give the last word to the pro-Kremlin cheerleaders. It is a convincing but weak copy of debate and ideological diversity. See, all sides are represented. Nothing is being hidden from you, the viewer. But in all the noise and smoke, you won't find the truth either. On my first day on set, my role became clear. I was meant to play the pitiable imbecile and birthday party pinata. Everyone would get a chance to step up and have a whack. We discussed everything from Russian Olympic athletes facing bans for doping allegations to Syria, where both Moscow and Washington had forces deployed. The questions were, to put it mildly, rather leading. The United States carries itself with an air of impunity, one of the shows told me. Quote, isn't that disastrous? Another turned to me and said, quote, Obama referred to Russia as a regional power. Can't we say that's when all the problems between our two countries began? I felt bruised but more annoyed that between my stammering Russian and interruptions by the host and other guests, I didn't get a chance to say more than a couple of sentences. During one segment, devoted to tensions between Russia and the United States, an evergreen topic, a digital animation of a grizzly bear clawing away at a bald eagle played on a large screen behind the panelists. The host of Time Will Tell, a former Russian paratrooper named Artyom Shadin, turned to me, quote, does it not seem to you, he asked, that all these children dying in Syria, in Eastern Aleppo, this fear about Russian missiles, all this is a result of how you have been pushed into being the world's gendarme and want to remain as such? I fumbled through an answer. Russia obviously sees itself as fighting against US hegemony, I said, but what is it fighting for? What is its strategic vision for itself and the world? Another guest, a Russian parliamentary deputy began to shout, quote, for Yugoslavia, for Libya, for Syria, for everything you have done these past 20 years. It was a non sequitur, obvious, but not entirely frivolous. After all, who could credibly defend the record of American foreign policy over the last two decades? The last time I went on the show, the topic of the day was a report prepared uh, by Russia's parliament on all the ways the United States itself had interfered in elections around the world. On time will tell, the panelists discussed the report with somber analytical seriousness these charges had no less merit than whatever Washington was directing at Moscow. It was a classic flourish of whataboutism, a technique that dates to Soviet times, meant to turn the tables to deflect any accusation by throwing it back at the accuser. Like all good whataboutisms, the report on election meddling was not entirely without merit. The sense of unprecedented violation among the American public over Russia's interference in the 2016 election did indeed veer toward naivete and hypocrisy. There's no point denying all the ways the US has intervened, often with tragic, conse tragic consequences, in the politics of countries in Latin America or Southeast Asia. The viewer at home was meant to be convinced not of Russia's innocence, only of everyone's shared guilt. I address the implication of the report that anti-Kremlin protests in Russia are somehow the work of foreign forces. The State Department, the US State Department above all, I suggested that it was a sign of the political elite's fear of their own people. Dissatisfaction and protest are presented as phenomena with exclusively foreign origins, not the result of genuine homegrown sentiment. I was shouted down before I could finish the thought. Fantasy, Russophobia, what does that have to do with anything? The guests yelled. I returned to time will tell every now and then over the next months, each time certain that this would be the day I would manage to say something subversive and devastatingly convincing on Russian state television. The day I would break or otherwise disrupt the choreographed rules of the genre. Of course, that never happened. Not only was I outnumbered, but I could interject only for a few seconds at most. And to make any points at all, I had to huff and puff and raise my voice. In the end, I came across as just another agitated, screaming, talking head, 
an interchangeable member of the choir in a symphony of noise. I was not dangerous, even when I raised points that challenged the Kremlin narrative of events, but in fact useful, doing my part to make issues of fact seem muddy and unknowable, proving that everything is a question of perspective and allegiance. Orwell, I thought, would be proud. Why expend energy on making your subjects believe or even uh, merely pay lip service to what they deep down know is untrue? when you instead can convince them to refuse the true-false dichotomy entirely. Perhaps the most Orwellian twist of all was that however much I thought I was turning the tables on a propaganda out out outfit like time will tell, I was in fact only strengthening it. I once traded impressions with another American living in Moscow who regularly goes on the show. He admitted the obvious, quote, I don't know exactly how I'm helping them, he told me but I wouldn't be there if I wasn't. Whether exhausted or dispirited or simply defeated, I stopped returning the producer's calls. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you so much for that extraordinary story and for sharing um, such a brilliant insight into your, your work and congratulations on your book, Between Two Fires, winner of the Orwell Prize for Political Writing 2021. It's fantastic that you were able to join us this evening from Greece. So. Um, enjoy. Thank you so much. It's the perfect ending to this wonderful um, event. So um, it just really remains for me to say a huge thank you to all of our um, incredible panelists and speakers this evening. Thank you to DJ Taylor, Josh Yaffa, Rebecca Solnit, uh, Sarah Wood and Ali Smith. And, um, and a huge thank you to the Orwell Foundation. It's an independent charity. Do follow them in their activities and prizes, including the Orwell Youth Prize. Thank you to all of the team at the Orwell Foundation, including um, James Tukey for making this evening possible. And thank you to our audience for being here with us. Um, for now, it's good night um, and we will see you again very, very soon. <laughs>